it felt like running into a wall of like, but there is no system or such that it exists. It's terrible. There are so many problems. Why don't I tap into the childcare innovation <laughs> scene, you know, and I'll go to their conferences and talk to their investors. And I'm like, maybe there might be a really cool team doing something that I can like help out and like join and, you know, and you can see where this is going. It was like crickets. There was nothing. Imagine if one third of our roads in London were impassable, or if one third of tube trains broke down overnight, or one third of London didn't have water or electricity. That would be on the front page of every newspaper in the world if that happened. And yet with childcare, it's like we don't even know that that's happened. It's something I ultimately feel passionate about is having women take their roles up in all levels of leadership in society. Well, they can't do that if they're like, sorting out paper mache volcano and odd socks day for children in need. We as human beings were not designed for one person, the mother, to stay with the child 24 hours a day. It's inhumane to do that. I can't imagine doing that all by myself. One of the problems I want to solve in the industry is that there isn't good pay prospects and career progression for childcare workers. It's not valued like it should be. You're going to be raising the future of this country, of the world. Exactly. So that is an important <laughs> job to do. Quick question. When did you discover that you're a leader? that your actions matter to those that look up to you. You may be an entrepreneur or an aspiring entrepreneur, innovating to change the world, or a CEO navigating a crisis, or a parent returning to work and learning to lead your career, your team, your children. There are many faces of leadership, and this is the podcast to explore them all. Welcome to Anatomy of a Leader with me, Maria Vorostovsky. I'm a headhunter and founder of HVO Search, where I help ambitious leaders hire their executive teams. My job today on this show is to help you discover your superpowers, to help you avoid making some of the same mistakes, and to remind you that even if you do, perfection doesn't and shouldn't exist. Thank you so much for listening and please do subscribe and follow this podcast because it really helps others to discover these incredible stories. This show will challenge the way you think and may even change your life. Rachel. Hello. So good to see you. Yes. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you for having me. I have had an amazing, fantastic experience with your business. Your customer service is just absolutely second to none. It's so good, isn't it? It's really, yeah, it really, really good. And I don't know any mother in London that doesn't know what Koru Kids is. Oh, that's nice. So for those that don't, can you tell us what is Koru Kids and what problem are you trying to solve? So what we do, well, we're a childcare company. And um, so we create different kinds of childcare services to help families um, all across the UK. And the first one that we created was a nanny service. Started off as um, really focusing on part-time care. So um, helping parents with that really difficult period after school from like 3.30 to like 6.30. And then we grew from there and now we do all kinds of nannies for all sorts of different situations. And we just launched um, a whole new service, our second service, which I'm very excited about called Home Nursery. And uh, it's for younger kids. And um, we love our nanny service dearly, but at the end of the day, nannies are really a thing that relatively wealthy families are gonna use. And uh, we all wanted to make childcare more affordable for everyone. So that's what Home Nursery is all about. And uh, it, we help um, people set up small childcare businesses in their homes. We train them, support them. We have a community. We make it an incredible career for these childcare workers. And they in turn provide really, really great um, child, high quality childcare, which we inspect and, and kind of regulate. And, uh, and then we can make that childcare available at a much more affordable rate um, to parents. So I love it because it just, it's great for everyone. You know, it's us, it's, it's great. Um, it's a great job, it's great for the kids, and it's amazing for parents. Mm. And what experiences led up to you founding Cora Kids? Why did you decide to do this business? So I, I'm from New Zealand originally. I'm from a really small um, sheep farming town. And uh, I, did, I did my undergrad in New Zealand, and then I came over, was lucky to win a, um, a scholarship to come over here 
and uh, I did my master's and PhD and then um, started working in business. And I kind of got to this point um, where I, I was the CEO of a healthcare company and I'd had this life where it, it was sort of like you put in the effort and you get the reward. And it was a very clear ladder. You know, you work hard at school, you get into university, you work hard at university, you get into like, you, you work in the professional company and you just do X and Y and like AB result. Everything was predictable and very clear. And then all of a sudden I had my first baby and I was like, okay, well, what's the system for this? You know, <laughs> like, mm. cause I, I always, always, always there had been a system that was very rational and made sense. And I was like, okay, well, I'm sure someone's got a good system. So, you know, where's the, you do X and Y and you get A, B and C. And I looked around and I tried to figure out what the system was. And I was just, um, it was, it felt like running into a wall of like, but, but there is no system or, or such that it exists. It's terrible. There are so many problems, you know, it was excruciatingly expensive. I heard from friends who had slightly older kids than mine of all the problems in, you know, how do you do holiday care? And um, people were moving out of London because they couldn't afford to have another kid or they were um, moving to be closer to family, even though they didn't want to because childcare didn't work. And then I started looking into it more and realizing it doesn't work for the parents, but it also doesn't work for the childcare workers. You know, they they feel very lonely, very vulnerable, often exploited. The pay is is some of the lowest paid people, you know, in our society when they're doing something so important. And it was like every aspect of this system that I looked at wasn't working, you know. And so my next um, my my next reaction was, okay, well, I by then I'd been working in healthcare for a number of years. And I'm, I was used to having lots of innovation. And so in healthcare, there are lots of innovation conferences all the time. There's loads of startups. There are lots of investors who specialize in healthcare innovation. It's just a very vibrant kind of people trying to fix these problems. And I was like, okay, well, why don't I tap into the childcare innovation <laughs> scene, you know, and I'll go to their conferences and talk to their investors. And I'm like, maybe there might be a really cool team doing something that I can like help out and like join. And, you know, and you can see where this is going. It was like crickets. Mm -hmm. There was nothing. There were, there were at that time, no startups doing this. There were no investors who knew anything, who'd even knew that there was a problem, let alone funding it, let alone specializing it. There were, the, the, it was just nowhere on anyone's even radar, the problems. So, um, so I just got to the point where this actually made me very angry. Um, and, uh, and I just was one of those like, oh, I'm going to have to do this, aren't I? <laughs> this is it this is a problem that the world needs to be yeah. solved and I mean I have my own personal opinion on that but why is there no innovation why is there nothing why has it been just so completely neglected what do you think the reason for it is I think there's a few reasons I mean it's like the world of um, product and tech and investment and VC has historically been an extremely male world and the world of childcare is female from top to toe in every dimension. So childcare is a, is, a, is a service which is overwhelmingly produced by women and overwhelmingly consumed by women. And obviously, when you'd send your kid to nursery, both a mum and a dad both benefit. But I just happen to know from the sign-ups, you know, on my own platform, it is 95% the woman who is, it's the mum who is the one who's signing up. And... Um, so, so I think these two worlds just didn't know each other. And, you know, so I'm someone who straddles both of those two worlds. I was running a health tech company. So I knew about tech and product and design. And then I became a mom. And I think it, um, it takes, you know, uh, someone and, and a team of people who kind of straddle those two worlds to, to pull them together. I think this is the main problem in the sense that it's only that women that reach a certain level of seniority who are now facing this issue themselves and thinking, what is going on? Because there's just not so many women at the top who are even, you know, in that position where they have kids and where they want to, you know, continue in their careers. But there are so many other women who are suffering below that, who don't necessarily reach those higher echelons where, you know, they may not be in a position to say, you know what, I'm just going to drop everything. And I'm just going not to say that you are dropping everything, <laughs> but, um, you know, and, and, totally. and do a business. And 
this is for me where I feel so passionate about is that, you know, we, we, we need more women to get to that level to say, you know, this problem is important. I have the skills, experience, the motivation, the knowledge, the, you know, to be able to solve that. But, you know, we're still kind of bashing against that wall where there's just not enough of us there yeah. <laughs> to, to talk about it, to shout about it. Totally. And, you know, when it comes to fixing childcare, you're in this very ironic catch 22 where mm-hmm. it's like, why aren't there more women, you know, who are able to do this sort of founding a business, raising money, or you know, all the stuff that that you, you that you have to do? Well, in part, it's because childcare isn't good enough. So we're in this kind of catch twenty two situation where, in order to improve childcare, childcare needs to be really good. Well, that's not going to work, is it? Yeah. I think what we need is many more women leaders throughout every level of society to make sure that these issues that women know about through their role as mom or through whatever um that that we can kind of bring that experience because when you don't have that experience in the room you end up with some incredibly important um policies like mm-hmm. around childcare for example that just don't receive any airtime at all women on the whole are generally considered more capable if they come across as nice as opposed to kind of shouting from the rooftops and demanding things you know the whole thing of like don't rock the boat don't be too difficult don't be too challenging but really the issues that are important to women are just being brushed to the side because the men don't have an understanding of it if they have not gone through it themselves so i love what you did with um, uh, the parental Mm. leave league where you reorganized the glass well please you know talk yeah. about that because i thought that was you know fantastic initiative i'm so proud of this campaign it was all about um paternity leave and we come up with this paternity league and we took um the best places in the world best places to work the kind of standard like top 50 um and we reordered them so we, we we reordered them based on their paternity leave policies so we found out what their paternity leave policies mostly by asking them um sometimes we had some sort of insider info for the mm. ones that didn't just tell us and uh, and then we reordered them and we were trying to um bring attention to the issue of paternity leave and the reason i care really deeply about paternity leave is because i think that a lot of inequality really stems from those very first days and first months What happens is the mum and the dad are, let's assume for a minute that it's a mum and a dad. Obviously, I know it not not always is. Um, But the the mum and the dad, they both start off equally clueless, right? Like none none of us are born knowing how to look after a baby. Everyone has to learn. And having gone through that myself, you know, I know how terrifying it is. You start off with that similar level of terror. And then the mum might take a year off, let's say. And during that year, the mum becomes the expert, not just on like how to look after the baby, but the mum knows where is the first aid kit kept? What vaccinations has this baby had? Because the mum is the one taking them to the thing. So naturally it becomes just, it just makes sense that the mum's going to do the three year vax, even though they're both, you know, let's say back at work at that time. And then let's say it just makes sense that the mum's going to also do the other GP visits because she was the one that did the first ones for the vax. And it just makes sense that every time any of the kids are sick, well, the mum is the one who knows where the the first aid kit is and knows what medications they're on and does the GP visit. So, And gradually you get this kind of like scope creep or like mission creep, you know, Mm. where the mum is just the expert on all of these things. And it's not just that's a medical example, but it goes across all sorts of things. You know, if the mum has an older kid and is, is the one taking the kid to school while on the one year off, well, the mum is the one who knows the other parents. So she's the one organizing all the um, birthday parties. She's the one who has the relationship with the teacher. So she's the one that the teacher calls. So, so much of the inequality in the home load and the kind of mental load really stems from the inequality of that of that maternity leave. Mm-hmm. And so the reason I, I love this idea of paternity leave is because if you can get the dad in there for all those things, well, then, you know, the dad also knows some of this stuff mm. or maybe they divide it up in a different way. And it's completely transformative, you know, and then if the ultimate something, something I, I, I ultimately feel passionate about is having women take their roles up in all levels of leadership in society. Well, they can't do that if they're like 
sorting out the, you know, paper mache volcano and the like mm. zombie outfit and the, you know, odd socks day for children in need and all the thousands of things that you have to do with kids. Yeah. Like that it just has to be more equal. Yeah, we forgot the odd socks day the other day. I was like, oh, I don't I think I think I'm not receiving the emails and they are in my inbox. Oh, the problem is you won't be I the don't. problem is you'll be receiving like 10 emails and uh, my school actually 2 weeks ago set a world record in our household for the least amount of notice given for a costume needed (laughs) they gave us they gave us 14 hours notice of a costume day the next day and we were kind of all 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 of the mums and of course it is the mums um on the whatsapp group are all scrabbling around for costumes Mm. you know if you have a board meeting a board pack that you're also meant to be preparing like these you can't invent time like it comes from somewhere you know and it's really stressful because you know you already have deadlines for your work let alone having you know such short deadlines for something (laughs) you know a school activity and then you're forced to choose what's more important you know your deadline your the other children's deadline or your sanity because you might have to drop one of them and which one's you know choosing your kids or you're choosing your career totally let's face it work is important i mean it's one of the things that gives you purpose it makes you feel good about yourself you're contributing to society you're contributing to the financial health of the country your family and the system is not designed to have kids And to go to work. And I'm really glad that you are working on this problem because we're just so necessary. And like you, when you were saying that, oh, there must be something that exists, there must be a system. I didn't think there were barriers to me before I had kids. I thought I was just going to continue on as I was. And I knew how hard the kids are to raise because my mom had my brother and sister who were 14 years younger. So I knew the aspect of taking care of the kids and, you know, the sleepless nights, you know, the sick days what I didn't factor in and what I didn't have a model of is a mother who was working and who had kids and I think this is a problem for our societies because we don't have that many people to model our careers on because you know it's only until we're as actually there isn't a path to follow and the systems have not been created for us. So we now need to create those systems and yeah so I just feel very blessed that your company exists and (laughs) that you have taken it so seriously to pursue that because I think a lot of women and ultimately their partners too really need this to work yeah I mean really childcare is the um is the plug that makes it all work certainly in my personal life um there's no way I could do what I do without it and what what I find most annoying is that even the childcare system and even our school system sort of assumes that there's that one parent is at home um, not working so you know just think about school holiday for example Mm -hmm. like children get 13 weeks of school holiday a year I mean I know you know this (laughs) but a lot of non-parents don't realize this and it's until it's kind of smacks them in the face yeah that children get 13 weeks of school holiday a year most parents only get five each so even if parents each take the maximum holiday and never go on holiday together, which would be pretty sad, they still don't reach, they still don't together yeah. add up to 13 weeks. Like, who would design this system? It doesn't make any sense at all. Or, yes. an, you know, another example, school finishes at 3.30. What are the kids meant to do after that? Mm. that this is exactly why I, our first ever service was after school nannies. And the demand was insane for it when we started. I mean, it's still very high. Um, and, uh, you know, that's, that was the, the, the source of our initial growth. Because people were lit- literally not able to work because there wasn't a way of taking care of their kids from 3.30 to 6.30. One of the very first things I did in, in the first year was um, I tried to understand uh, whether there were after-school clubs. And I, I actually did, um, in London, I did 33 freedom of information requests. I did a request to every borough in London plus the city of London. And, uh, and I added them all up. And I discovered that one in three London schools didn't even have an after-school club. Wow. Let alone the ones that were full or you kids might not like it. One in three didn't even have one. Mm. What do the parents at those schools do? Mm. And... What, what further surprised me, I mean, fact shocked me, but the further shocking aspect of that was that stat was not known. 
that was not a, no one collected that, no one looked at it. Again, this comes back to like, because this is an, an, an issue that almost entirely affects women, just, just, it had no airtime, had no focus. And yet to me, that is a failing of basic infrastructure. You know, imagine if one third of our roads in London were impassable, or if one third of tube trains broke down overnight, or one third of London didn't have water or electricity, you know, that would be a mate that would be on the front page of every newspaper in the world if that happened in London. And yet with childcare, for some reason, it's, it doesn't matter. Who mm-hmm. cares? It's like we don't even know that that's happened. I did this post on LinkedIn. Actually, Mm -hmm. it was was two posts talking about the cost of childcare in the UK and then a follow-up post about addressing some of the criticisms that came my way. And two things I didn't address were, well, if we reduce the cost of childcare... How are you going to be supporting the providers? You know, surely they also deserve to have a good career and not be taken advantage of. And the other point was, well, you're just outsourcing your childcare to other people. And that's been seen as something that's shameful, that, you know, you're not spending enough time with your own kids and shoving them to someone else who may not necessarily care about them. And it's your responsibility to look after them. What is your response to those two points? I think on the second one, um, when it's schooling, no one really says that. You know, we have a history of um, it being fine to send your kids to school when they're, you know, when they're five. Um, And not that many people will say, you know, why are you doing that? That's a terrible thing to do. You should be homeschooling your kids. That's not really a thing that you hear. Um, So I think we've just culturally decided that sort of it's, it's fine to do that from five, but, you know, for some reason there's a bit more reluctance to do it when they're um, younger than five. But it should be the same thing. It, like if you're sending them to really good, high-quality um, people who've been vetted, who've been registered, who have been trained appropriately, who are inspected, you know, all of which is what is built into the Cory Kids um, home nursery model, then um, you're actually doing something which is great for your kids. And there is a huge amount of academic evidence that actually um, sending your kids uh, or having your kids attend a high quality setting readies them for school, you know, much more than than um, kind of um, attending a low quality setting. So I guess that's how, that's how I would think about the first one, the, the second one. I sometimes you sometimes hear this um, phrase, you know, why do you have kids if you don't want to look after them? And it always makes me think, no one ever says that about getting married, you know? Imagine if people said, why did you get married if you don't want to spend every single second with your husband? Mm. I've never heard anyone say that, right? Mm. Like, we understand, certainly no one would say that to a husband, why do you get married if you don't want to spend every single second with your wife? Mm. Literally, I'm not sure any husband has ever been asked that. And why is it that we that, that they haven't? Well, because we understand that as human beings, we are social creatures and we need to fill our days with a variety of different kinds of social interaction. And to the, the idea of just focusing all of your social interaction on one person seems kind of inhumane, right, when you put it like that. And yet that is the thing that we, we or some people are very comfortable saying to a woman. I have never heard that said to a man. Why do you have kids if you don't want to look after them? Mm. I've heard that said to women... I don't know, a hundred times. I mean, mm-hmm. I hang out in kind of these groups where people say this sort of thing. So that's, I guess, my, my feeling on the second question. Um, the first one was about paying workers properly. I feel very strongly about this because one of the problems I want to solve in the industry is that there isn't good pay prospects and career progression for childcare workers. It's not valued like it should be. They are often vulnerable to exploitation. You often get people who are not on good contracts. They don't receive the employment protection that they should. So if they get sick, they don't get sick pay. If they become pregnant themselves, they don't themselves get maternity benefits. So for me, it's always been incredibly important that we build that into what we're doing and we make sure that all our workers get all of the rights that they're entitled to. Then in terms of the pay, um, this is why I love what we're doing on Home Nursery so much. We're such a mission-driven team and company because becoming a childminder is actually one of the highest paid things that you can do in childcare. So we have right now several of our childminders who are earning now today over 50,000 pounds through their childminding work, which in 
I think in any industry, that is a really good salary. In childcare, it's stonkingly good. I mean, that is an absolutely unheard of Mm -hmm. salary. And we have several of these people. And, you know, how can they do it? Well, they work from their homes, they look after several children, and they work with a couple of assistants. And so what one of the things we do is we help them um, find the assistants and we kind of sort out all the back office and the contracts and all of that, and we help help them make that happen. And that means that um, they can very safely and very in a very high-quality way look after um, more kids. Uh, and, and, what, and what that means is that the parents can pay an extremely competitive rate for the childcare, and yet the person who's orchestrating the whole thing gets paid this really great sum. Now, can everyone immediately go to that? No, they can't. But what they can do is they can work up to that over time, just like in any other career. So what I feel like this should be, and I get to build my own system, which is cool, um, is a really clear career framework. That sense of, you know, if I do A, B, C, X and Y will happen. Like this kind of transparent, like if you want to take this path, if you want to get to the next level, do this and you'll get to the next level. Take on an assistant and you'll get, you take on another assistant and you'll get this much. You know, work these many hours and you'll get this much. And it's up to people whether or not they want to choose that. Yeah. So there's a, there's a different path, which I think is completely legitimate, where someone says, do you know what? I don't want to have loads of kids in, in, my, in my setting. I don't want to have two assistants. I don't, I don't, it's, I don't need to earn 50,000. What I want to do is work only a few hours a week. I want to look after my baby and two other kids under three, let's say, and I want to earn 20,000 or something. Um, And it's going to just top up the the family income and this is how I want to live my life. Through the platform that we have created, you can also do that. But I think the important thing is the availability of the options and the choice, the fact that it's all based on um, contracts and knowing what is expected of you and transparency. Mm. I love what you're saying about creating this as a career. What you're doing is that you're recognizing the importance of care and making that something that people can make careers out of and earn a living out of. We as human beings, we're not designed for one person, the mother, to stay with the child 24 hours a day. It's inhumane to do that. When I had my kids and my husband and I shared everything, like we were there completely 100% together. I can't imagine doing that all by myself. Or, you know, back in the day when we'd have grandparents or the cousins, the uncles, the aunts, the the whole group of people supporting you. And what you're creating is that ecosystem that, you know, we, we don't have that anymore. You know, we have much smaller units that we live in. And you're creating that ecosystem to replace what we have forgotten that we need. Yeah, I think there's a lot. There's a lot in that. You know, it is extremely difficult to be the sort of two parent, two kid, no relatives, like family, the kind of nuclear family, it basically doesn't really work. You have to find some way, as you say, of replacing this extended family concept. I think if you have extended family around you, like brilliant, I think that's, you know, you're very lucky, but so many people now just don't have that around them. Yeah. And it doesn't work to, to live in this very atomized kind of separate way. Like you say, it's not how we're um, designed to live. And uh, so I think it's probably right that a lot of what we're doing is building in that support network. Um, And if you can get that without paying them, if you can get that through your extended family, I think that's brilliant and you're very lucky, but a lot of people can't. If you do have grandparents, I mean, grandparents are now choosing to live their own life. Right, yeah. Or perhaps maybe they're even still working. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, like my my husband's parents, they still in work, you know, so they don't necessarily have that free time to spend with their grand, you know, this kind of carefree fantasy. Perhaps they don't also want to. Maybe they want to live their retirement years child free. They've done their part. So we are increasingly living in societies where people live longer and the expectations are changing. So we're living in smaller and smaller units. But it's, you're right that, you know, a lot of what we're trying to do is um, really bring value and prestige mm-hmm. to this caring occupation. And like you say, a lot of it, uh, a lot of the time, um, historically, it just hasn't been valued in the way that it should be. And so that's one of the reasons that um, we rebranded it. Uh, you know, it is, it is childminding for people who know what that is. Um, but that that word doesn't sit well with a lot of people, and so we rebranded it as home nursery instead. 
um, we try to we try to make it really beautiful. We try to make it, um, you know, we think about how can it look visually cool? How can we think about bringing like, um, for example, let me give you an example of, of how we do this. When someone becomes registered with us and we send them their contract, we could have just printed it out on like some paper on, you know, in like Times New Roman font 12 or something on some paper. That would have been the quickest thing to do. But what we actually did was we got one of our designers to invest some time in making that document really beautiful. And we use a be beautiful brand. We have some gorgeous ways that we can realize it um, on paper. No one externally is ever going to see that document. You know, it doesn't go out to families. It doesn't go on our website. It's got nothing to do with the children. It's just the contract. But for us, that was important because it's a tiny way that we say this contract is important because you are important and what you're doing is important. And it's we want to make that beautiful mm. because it's important. And we try to bring that flavor. Mm. That's making me like teary. <laughs> I think it's such a beautiful thing to do. We want to have people who will take care of our kids. It's the most precious thing that we have. And how can we show appreciation exactly. and show that actually what you're doing is so valuable? Like, how can we show that what you're doing is so important that you're not just a person like, you know, it's easily replaceable next week. It's going to be somebody else. But, you know, we really care about the skills that you have, what you bring to the table, because you're going to be you're going to be raising the future of this country of the world. Exactly. So that is an important <laughs> job to do. Totally. And when we first did the um, some of the user research for, the, for Home Nursery, um, we spoke to some existing childminders and one of the childminders um, said to us, oh, when I'm at a dinner, if I meet people, and she was a very successful childminder. Um, she had a huge waiting list. She was off state upstanding. And she was amazing. And she said, well, when I go out to dinner and people ask me what I do, I don't say I'm a childminder. I say I work in education or I say I run my own business. And she would, the way she felt about that word childminder, I just thought that was such a shame. And after hearing that, my team set ourselves a goal. We said, let's make a service which is so good and so inspirational for the people who work in it that when they, when they go to dinner parties – they say, I am a Cory Kids early educator, which is our word for it. And they are so proud to say, say that. That's the feeling that we want. Okay, how can, we, how can we get them that feeling? That brings me back to the point about more about you as the founder and the attention to detail, the deep thought that goes into everything that you're doing. Do you see yourself as a perfectionist? Definitely not. Not at all. Um, I think, it, it, you know, Maybe, maybe to my detriment. Um, I don't. I know there's some CEOs who stay very attached to the details when their companies are very big, and I physically do not understand how they do it. Mm. <laughs> I mean, they must just only look at some details and not others. Um, and and I guess there's some way that they figure out which details like to look at. But I have always, from day one, I have always been a person who um, cares very much about appointing the right people setting the right direction and then giving them autonomy. I'm absolutely not a micromanager. Mm. I don't mean a micromanager. I'm talking about sort of paying attention to really small detail and wanting everything to be completely perfect. I think I would have driven myself completely mad. If, yeah. when Because what we're doing is so ambitious. There's so many things that we've had to build all at once. And... Um, we we just there are things that you know I, I've been going for five years now and there's things that drive me crazy about the product that we still haven't done uh because we've been doing because there's just so much to do we've been doing everything else mm -hmm. so to give you one example here's something that here's something that we don't have and it drives me crazy mm -hmm. and also drives my team crazy is we we're desperate to build um uh double login so that a um uh, two when you have two parents involved um, so that both parents can separately log into the same account. And it just, it's constantly sort of, 
I don't know, three or four on our priority list, but it's never number one. Mm. And we just haven't been able to get to it. And, you know, it kills us because we're all about gender equality and we really, really want to do this, but we just haven't done it. Mm. So I think but with product, you it's always about very tough decisions about what to prioritise. One of the things about working in childcare is there is so many problems to solve that um, the, the the amount of stuff that we could build and want to build is just years, years of product work. Mm-hmm. Um, it's very painful to make those decisions. It is. I mean, because you're choosing between the big rocks rather than yeah. the big, the small, the <laughs> less important. You're having to choose what's really going to make the difference. Let's talk about the the recruitment part mm. and by the way, what you're talking about, the the contract, that's it's literally nearly made me cry. <laughs> no. It's such a beautiful thing to do. And, you know, the fact that you even thinking along those lines, I just think it's 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 rare. Oh, thank you. Do you know do you know what made me think of that? Is um you know in Lord of the Rings. So Lord of the Rings was filmed in my homeland, New right. Zealand. Right. And I knew a few people who were extras in it and stuff. And um one of the things that the um the people who made the armor for the for the Lord of the Rings films are based in Wellington, um, in New Zealand. And I did a tour of their studio. And they show you when you do this tour, they show you the inside of the armor. And the the outside is etched in these incredible, beautiful, intricate patterns. And then they show you the inside, and the inside is also etched with these beautiful patterns. Mm. And that was never seen on film. It was never going to be seen on film. The reason they did that was because the people who were wearing the armor, they felt like it would just make them feel more like the king or whoever they were meant to be playing. And I always remember that, Mm. you know, that these little details really matter. It's like, how do you instill that feeling into a person through mastery through art yeah. through craft through you know really taking care of the the details the details that, and that's design yeah. and that's brand right it's yeah. all these things that you can never measure the metric you know what mm. what metric did that move you can't it's just mm. you have to build that with conviction mm. talking about contracts and creating you know child minding child care nannying as a legitimate you know, career that you can be proud of. And this is what I was just saying to you earlier is that, you know, we didn't click until very recently that what you do is so recruitment focused Mm. that you're more of an expert in recruitment (laughs) than I am. So I'm curious to hear your tips about recruitment and how you feel about, you know, building your teams and as well as sort of, you know, finding the right people for the business and the families. Well, it's funny, isn't it? I I mean, I think we've trained probably 15,000 nannies or something. Wow. And so we we have received in a number of applications would have been in the hundreds of thousands. Um, so yes, <laughs> quite a lot of people. And then my team um, currently around ninety people. And um, so we've gone through a lot of um, of recruiting internally as well. I, I I have a lot of really strong beliefs in recruiting, and um, I think that the way that most people do it is terrible. Um, so how on earth do I sum it up? I can talk for a long time on this. I think, um, firstly, I think it's a source of an enormous amount of human misery that people go into the wrong job. And, uh, so you get the wrong fit between the person and the role. And it's not that the person is bad. It's just that it's a bad fit. And I think at the source of a lot of that is that job ads are by and large awful and they give you a terrible, um, or, or a really inadequate view of what the job actually is. And so what we try to do is, as much as we possibly can, we try to bring to life what the job's going to actually be like in our job ads. So, for example, we love using audio um, audio notes, voice notes, and we put a voice note, usually from me, sometimes from other people, uh, explaining what the job is and why it's important we have a bunch of um, audio notes on our um, careers page that talk about different uh, things within the company so that you can, you know, like how does our engineering work or like what are the different teams in Cory Kids, that sort of thing. And I, we have a different leader from in, within Cory Kids saying these things. The reason we use audio notes is because you just get so much more sense of the person when you hear them talk. I mean, it's like a podcast, right? 
Um, and But the reason we don't do video is because with video, yeah, people get like, they have to do their hair and they get, you know, you have to have all the lighting. It's just the overhead is so much higher with that than audio. So that's why we do audio. And, and uh, another thing we do in our job ads is we, um, we do this thing called day in the life where we um, try to bring to light, you know, it's literally like 9 a.m. you do this, 9.30 you do this, 10.30, and it's meant to be illustrative. And one of the really important things we do in that is we don't sugarcoat it. Like we don't try to, we do not try to make this sound like the, like the best job for everyone ever. What we try to do is make it really real. So if this is a job where you, where let's say it's a customer service job and you're talking on the phone all day to people, the someone who loves, who, someone who, someone who gets tired from talking to people, that is a terrible fit with that job, yes. right? So we should make a day in the life that makes it extremely clear that you are going to be talking all day long. Mm. And there are people who love that, right? Who are going to be perfect for that and also terrible for that, other people. Uh, you know, whereas if it's a if it's a, a job where you're working with data, we should make it clear in the day in the life, you're going to be by yourself working with only data and you're only going to talk, let's say the day in the life, you only talk to one person all day. Yeah. Put that in the day in the life because that is real. And again, there'll be people who for whom that is a nightmare and there'll be other people where they're like, oh my God, I love that. I don't need to talk to anyone, you know? Yeah. So it's all about the fit and just being honest. And then, um, and that, cause that's kind of how we, we do applications. And then in processing applications, um, we do something called blind hiring. So I think very strongly that um, when you look at the brands on people's resumes, um, whether that's, you know, Google or McKinsey or Oxford or, you know, whatever, um, you, that, that, but that causes you to make mishires because you overlook people who are wonderful but don't have the right brands. And you also give too much credit to people who do have those brands but actually aren't the right fit. And I have made both of those mistakes before and I don't want to ever make them again. And so it's much better to um, have some application questions and then uh, and, and divorce them from the name and the CV get them, we, we blind double mark. So um, we score the application, we, we separate the questions so we don't um, have a halo effect or a horn effect and then we um, blind double mark them and then we only only once you're past that um, kind of initial screen do you get to go into the, the kind of proper talking to someone um, bit. And that is intended to take out bias at that very first stage. And... Uh, I can, there's so much more I can say on this. I know, <laughs> Maybe I, I know. pause there. I <laughs> to be honest, I feel like I need to have just a, an episode just with you, just on, on this topic alone. Um, but I think it does make a difference when you remove all of that because when you look at, you know, the McKinsey, you already make you know, expectations, you already have an idea, an assumption about what this person's going to be like. And then you don't ask the questions in the first place because you just assume that you already know. Totally. And likewise, when you don't have that on the CV, you ask questions that lead you down the opposite path of trying to prove that this person is not going to be right. So I love the fact that you are taking that into consideration, already putting process in place to do that. Um, and we've made our hiring has just gone from strength to strength since we put this process in. And we definitely have people where I'm not sure they would have passed a CV screen actually, but they are, but they made it all the way to getting an offer and they're phenomenal. Mm. And this is how you get more people into the right jobs as well. Yeah. Because rather than just looking from such a small pool, you're broadening it up completely and more people can you know, find where their passion is and what they're genuinely good at. Exactly. And these two things that I've talked about have to go together, by the way, because if you're asking people to answer some screening questions, application questions, that's a lot harder than just firing your CV out, right? So you're introducing a kind of an extra task. And if you're going to do that, you have to make sure that you invest in making your job ad really good because yeah. you've got to persuade people to actually do the thing. And the more honest it is I have found that as we the more context we put in it and actually the more we put in it saying this isn't the job for you you know if you so on with the example of the one where you're talking all day if we put in the job ad this is not the job for you if you need a lot of quiet reflection time right which sounds like it would kind of like like turn people away and it would but it turns away the wrong people anyway yes. you yes. know you you want you want to be so sharp and clear that you dramatically attract the people that actually are a good fit 
and dramatically turn away the people who would be a bad fit. Mm. Well, this is a natural filtering system and this is what you want because yeah. whilst it might look amazing that you're like, oh, we've received you know 10,000 CVs, well, someone or something has to go and filter it. Exactly. So if you already have a natural filtering system just to give, give you what exactly that you need, then that's it's doing its job. Yeah. And with being a founder, you know, leader of your business and leader within this industry too, what does leadership mean to you? I think it means setting setting a clear um, vision, vision and strategy and direction and imagining a future that doesn't exist. Um, and that's the thing that's so exciting to me is I get to create this future. And what seems impossible to you now, but should you achieve it will change the course of your life or business? Um, I find it hard to think of things that are impossible, particularly things I'm working on, because I think everything is possible. Um, I think government policy is probably in this category. So, um, because it does seem actually impossible. So I think what needs to happen in childcare is there needs to be vastly more government subsidy going in, funding, I mean. That seems impossible because it's government spend all over the place is being cut back. But if, um, but if it happened, that would totally change everything. It would be amazing. Mm. Rachel, thank you so much for coming on to the show. <laughs> I know you. you have to rush, but hey. um, really such a pleasure. I really appreciate this you being amazing. here and talking about your business. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining me here on Anatomy of a Leader. What did you discover in this episode? I'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments on YouTube or reviews on Apple Podcasts. And if you haven't already, hit that subscribe or follow buttons and I'll see you next week.